Hello, friends, and welcome. We are so glad that you are here. You are joining us, and we really are together because we are united over the Word of God, and God is going to lead us through this. We're studying the Adult Bible Study Guide, the Sabbath School lesson on the book of Mark this quarter, and we are now on lesson number five, Miracles Around the Lake, which is going to take us through the end of Mark 4, all the way through Mark 5 and 6. And uh, if you would like for yourself a copy copy of the, the, the notes that we use here as presenters that we put together, go ahead and send us an email at ssp at 3abn.org and just put in there something like send me the notes and we will get you on the list and every week you will get those notes and uh, they can certainly be a blessing to you and you might get a few bonuses in those notes or sometimes that we don't cover everything that we had intended to cover and uh, that will be there available to you. But before we get into the study, let me introduce you to who we have sitting here because there are some excellent presenters and students of the word. And right here on my left, we have John Dinsey. Thank you, uh, Professor. This is uh, le Monday's lesson. Mm -hmm. Can you hear a whisper above a shout? A whisper above a shout. Mm -hmm. Pastor John Lomacang. Mine is called On the Roller Coaster with Jesus. Your life may be going up and down. Mm -hmm. Find out how you could balance it out. Moving on then to Wednesday's lesson, Dr. Yvonne Shelton. I have rejection and reception. All right, so glad that you're here with us. And uh, then Ms. Shelley Quinn. I have Thursday's lesson and is a different kind of Messiah. All right, looks like we have good things that we are going to be studying today. But before we get started, uh, Pastor Dinsey, would you mind opening us in prayer? Yes, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. But we know that without you, Lord, we cannot understand this book. So we thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit and we ask for the blessing of the Holy Spirit so that you will speak through us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will also help everyone listening to understand your message. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and get your Bible out right now. And uh, if you can, open it up to Mark chapter 4. My name is Daniel Perrin, and I am taking us through Sunday's lesson, Calming a Storm. Now, this lesson takes us through what some people call the Great Galilean Ministry. Jesus spent most of his time, uh, as we have recorded in the Gospels, ministering in, the, in Galilee. This is the region in the north of the land of Israel. With a few times where he crossed the borders, borders into area that was outside of Israel, and then the annual trips that he would uh, take down to Jerusalem and Judea for the annual feasts. Now, the parallel accounts uh, with Mark, because Mark isn't the only gospel that tells these stories here, but you'll find those in Matthew chapters 8 and 9 and 14, and then again in Luke chapters 8 and 9. Now, in this great Galilean ministry is where you're going to find most of the stories of Jesus healing, going from town to town, teaching in the synagogues, and really interacting with the people at kind of a, a distance from what was going on down in Jerusalem because there, there's where some of his enemies were, kind of their headquarters, and so he somewhat kept a distance from them up in the north. Now, when Mark here reports on Jesus' Galilean ministry, it starts with... Uh, some sort of issue on the sea, and it's going to end with something happening on the sea as well. And in the middle is what Jesus does on the land. Now, I want to read the text that uh, Sunday's lesson covers in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, now this is the same day that Jesus was teaching those parables where he began actually standing in a boat, teaching. So he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. Oh, what does that mean? It just means that he was tired after his day of labor. He'd spent the entire day thinking, ministering, talking, and he just got in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. Mark adds that detail that we don't find in the other uh, gospels. And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. 
And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? that Even the wind and the sea obey him. Now, possibly you've never been to the Sea of Galilee. I never have either. But I just, I want to, I want to also let you know that you don't have to go to the Sea of Galilee necessarily to walk in Jesus' steps. We do that as we go through the scripture. But if you were to go to the Sea of Galilee, you'll actually find it by a few other names in the Gospels. The Sea of Gennesaret, the Sea of Tiberias, and John even refers to it one time just as the lake. But it was a small sort of sea, eight miles by 13 miles approximately. That's about 64 square miles. To put that into perspective, that is five times smaller than, the, than New York City, which is about 300 square miles. So this is not an incredibly large body of water. In fact, at any place on the shore, so I am told, you can see the entire shoreline of all of the Sea of Galilee, surrounded by hillsides that are, are brown in the, the dry season, green in the wet, rainy season, con contrasted with the, the beautiful blue of the water. But this sea is seven hundred feet below sea level, surrounded by hillsides that then uh, extend into mountains that rise to over 2,000, sorry, 1,400 feet above sea level. Now there are these gorges that, uh, that, that carve out the mountainside and come down toward the lake. And sometimes the cool air up in the higher elevations will rush down the gorges and uh, create some very sudden storms, uh, whipping up mist that you can hardly see through and howling winds that, that you can't even hear above, uh, hear, hear a person speaking above the house sound of the winds. And even today, boaters on the Sea of Galilee, especially if they have little boats, they're very careful sometimes not to get too far from shore because these storms can be very, very sudden. And it was one of these sudden storms that Jesus and his disciples encountered as, uh, as they're finishing off this day of labor. And it's just a reminder to us that if you are laboring in the cause of Christ, it doesn't mean there are not going to be storms. And we should not be surprised at them or think that for some reason Jesus has abandoned us and he no longer hears our cries. Uh, Jesus was right there with them in the boat, but their lives are in danger. And Mark's description here, remember Mark is kind of telling Peter's experience. Uh, Peter's a fisherman, describes it this way. The water that is supposed to be outside of the boat is now inside of the boat. And so their lives are in danger and uh, there's no amount of bailing that's going to help them now. And in the midst of this, Jesus is in perfect peace with the Father. And, and even for those of you who say you can sleep through anything, I doubt you would sleep through this. Uh, and I have, to, I have to take note of the fact here that the storm, and Jesus has to be getting wet in this, but the storm does not arouse him out of sleep. What does? It's the cries for help of his disciples. It is prayer that arouses Jesus. And when he gives the command immediately, and this is no coincidence, coincidence the storm is stilled. And Jesus moves promptly then into a debriefing session. All right, let's talk it out, disciples. Um, he did not fail to come to their aid, but he's going to now address their lack of faith. He asks them, why were you so fearful? And the Greek word here is delos. It really refers to cowardice or timidity, unwillingness to go on when times get tough. And what's interesting is that he, he accuses them rightfully of fear all while they are working. They were working to save Jesus's boat, all right? Save the ship that Jesus is in. They're working as, as hard as they can. And how often do we do the same things? We are working, we're doing everything possible that we can until we are overwhelmed and we feel like God has not supported our work. He has not done, he has not backed us up. We've tried everything we can. And then we say, Lord, I, I've done everything I can do. 
And it's very similar to what Jesus says there in Matthew 7, 21 and 22, 22 and 23, where he says, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy and cast out demons and work mighty miracles in your name? Didn't we work hard? Didn't we do all this stuff? And Jesus says, I'll have to tell them, sadly, I never knew you. You were trusting in you, but you never knew me. You weren't really trusting in me. You, you thought that if you worked hard enough, you could finally get into the kingdom. So he asks, why are you so fearful? Why the cowardice and timidity, the unwillingness to trust completely in me when I'm near you? In their response in the boat of, of, of the way that they interact with Jesus appears reasonable. Lord, help us. But Jesus shows that that was not at all reasonable when he was there sleeping next to them. Sometimes times get hard and we, we blame God because uh, he's not helping us out exactly when we want to. He says, I want you to trust in me fully and completely. Now, I have to point out here that in Revelation 21, verse 8, this same word, delos, the fearful, are among those who are outside of the city of the New Jerusalem, those who do not trust Jesus completely. Now, the very next verse, it says, and they feared greatly. That's a different Greek word there. That's phobos. And this refers, it can refer to terror, but it's also awe and amazement. They are absolutely amazed at Jesus, perfect peace and trust in God. And he sets, he sets that example for us about the kind of peace we can have as we place our confidence in the Father. And I want to share just a, a line here from the Desire of Ages, page 330. that describes Jesus' perfect peace in contrast with us sometimes. In the heart of Christ, where reigned perfect harmony with God, there was perfect peace. He was never elated by applause, nor dejected by censure or disappointment. Amid the greatest opposition and the most cruel treatment, he was still of good courage. I think of that when Jesus faced Pilate or the Jewish leaders, and he still manifested and exhibited that perfect peace and trust. He didn't get excited when things were going great and get upset when things were going poorly. Simply moved on with the Father's plan. But many who pressed, profess to be followers have, many who profess to be his followers have an anxious, troubled heart because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. They do not make a complete surrender to him for they shirk from the consequences that such a surrender may involve. Unless they do make this surrender, they cannot find peace. And then this statement ends like this. It is the love of self that brings unrest. Mm -hmm. And I go back to Jesus then saying, it was all about you. You were doing this for you, but you did not really know me. We've tried everything. And so Jesus then gives us a, a living illustration here of Isaiah 26, verse three. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Uh, we now move to Monday's portion of the lesson, and this portion is entitled, Can You Hear a Whisper Above a Shout? And in a moment, you'll find out why this is the title. Uh, the lesson says, read Mark 5, 1 through 20. What can we learn about the great controversy from this amazing account? And again, about the power of Jesus. So, Beginning in Mark chapter 5, verse 1, we read, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Uh, the Gadarenes, of course, is called uh, the Gergesenes in Matthew chapter 8. Now we go to verse 2. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Mm -hmm. Now it says immediately here, but uh, you're going to find out why it says immediately in a moment. Now, the, as you heard, the disciples had just, just been through a horrible night, a storm. They were fearful for their lives. And now this man that came out of the tombs was coming at them. And it appeared that he would tear everybody to pieces the way he was coming at them. Verse 3, it says, who had his dwelling among the tombs. 
and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Now, why would they want to bind this man? Is because anyone passing by uh, would be chased by this man and he would try to hurt them. Verse 4, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. Now, what kind of person is this that you want to bind uh, with shackles and chains? And the chains have been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. Apparently, they had tried. So we're looking at somebody that has what you might call superhuman strength. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with a person that is demon-possessed. And so, verse 5, notice what it says, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So this man had all kinds of scars. He was not a pretty sight. He was coming to apparently try to hurt them. Now it says, uh, interestingly enough, in the book called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. This is written by a Jewish person. His name is Alfred, I'm going to say Edersheim, a little bit of German pronunciation there. Uh, he's a Jew, and he gives you kind of the Jewish background on things, and this is what he says concerning this. The language and conduct of the demonized, whether seemingly his own or that of the demons who influenced him, must always be regarded as a mixture of the Jewish, human, and demoniacal. The demonized speaks and acts as a Jew under the control of a demon. Thus, if he chooses solitary places by day and tombs by night, it is not that demons really preferred such habitations, but that the Jews imagined it and that the demons acting on the existing consciousness would lead him in accordance with his preconceived notions. That's uh, in book three, page 608 through 609 of the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. Uh, excellent insight on Jewish customs and the time that Jesus lived in. Now, this man lived in the tombs. He was not living in a regular home because really nobody could contain this man. Now, it's interesting that it says in verse 6, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran mm -hmm. and worshipped him, mm -hmm. but... Remember that the lesson is entitled, Can You Hear a Whisper Above a Shout? Because he was shouting. He was screaming. Remember, he shouted day and night. This man was demon-possessed and it appeared that he was going to tear the disciples and Jesus to pieces. I love the way it is written in the book, Ministry of Healing. It's like the disciples just went through this night. Wow, finally we're on the land. Everything is fine now. Uh, of course, they had peace when Jesus called the storm to peace. Now, it's interesting that uh, it paints there in the, in the book, Ministry of Healing. When the disciples see this man coming at them, they start running, mm -hmm. running for their lives. And they're running and they're, is Jesus with us? <laughs> and they look around and Jesus is in the same place where he was as the man came running. And Jesus just lifted up his hands and the man could come no further, but dropped to the ground and in worship. Now, when he spoke, he did not speak his own words. And this is what it says in verse 7. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So this man was not speaking his own words. The demons were speaking through him. And this tells us the danger of allowing demons to come into your life, you no longer speak your own words. The devil uses you whenever he pleases. Now, in the lesson itself, uh, it says the following. When the man came near to Jesus, he fell down before him. The words fell down, translated the Greek verb proskineo, usually translated to worship. It seems the man recognized that Jesus was someone who could help him. But when he opened his mouth, the demons inside him shouted at Jesus, who could hear the man's whispered plea for help above the demon's shout. Beautiful, beautiful explanation. And uh, 
Again, the demon spoke to the man, but Jesus heard the unspoken cry of this man. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. I'm going to, have to try to read that in a moment. Now it says in verse 8, Mark 5, 8, For he said to him, Come out of the man. Jesus saw the situation, and Jesus says, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And notice now that even though there are many demons, there are, they are in front of Jesus in front of somebody who possesses almighty power. Also, he begged them earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. And Jesus could have done that. But it says there in verse 11, Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons, notice the word, begged him. You see, Jesus is in control of this situation. Just as if you have any situation in your life, if you let Jesus take control, he will take control of whatever situation is in your life, even if you are possessed by demons. So they all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Now, this is uh, very interesting because it helps us understand that demons cannot possess animals without permission. Mm -hmm. They cannot. So they're begging to possess the swine. And I also tell you, demons cannot possess you mm -hmm. nor me without permission. Mm -hmm. Now, who gives them permission? We don't have time to dwell on this, but it is you or I that give the demons permission. And I encourage you not to do that by the things you do, the places you go to. Be very, very careful. We don't have time to dwell on this. But notice what it says now in Mark 5, 13. And at once, Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So it appears that um, these demons were up to no good. Really, when a demon enters a person, they're not going to dare to make your life better. I remember we were talking to a, a lady one time in Puerto Rico. With, uh, I was with Pastor Portes. And the lady kept talking to us, telling us that she was hearing voices and that uh, the voices were telling her to do evil things. And I asked the lady, so do you feel happy that these vo you're hearing these voices? And she said, no, I don't. And so uh, this is the reality of anyone that allows Satan into his life. And so it says, uh, verse 14, so, when, so those who fed the swine fled. And they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Praise the Lord. Jesus took this man and blessed him, took the demons out of him, and now the man is well. He's in his right mind. And now he has clothes on. Apparently he didn't have clothing on. And so it says in verse 16, And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from the region. And when he got into the boat, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Why? Because he felt secure and safe with Jesus. You and I are secure. We're safe with Jesus. However, Jesus did not permit him, but, but said to him, Go home, tell your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Praise the Lord. Jesus left there a light for that uh, community that brought light in dark places. Amen. Tell what the Lord has done for you. We're going to take a quick break for a moment and then be right back to finish this lesson. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three Abian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. 
Thank you for watching, and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back. We are now going to continue with Tuesday's lesson. And Tuesday is July 30th, On the Roller Coaster with Jesus. You know, when you think about life, it is a roller coaster, but it's good to be on the roller coaster with Jesus. Uh, some of you may be going through life's up and ups and downs now, wondering where the downs are going to end and where the ups will continue. But if you're on a roller coaster with Jesus, that's the best place to be. I've said many years ago, I'd rather be in a storm with Christ than in a calm without Him. And how fitting it is that the title of the lesson that Shelley assigned to me on the roller coaster with Jesus. And uh, my name is John Lomakang, and I'll be walking you through this very important topic. Let's go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. Looking at a very important story, and there's no unimportant story in the Bible, but let's start with verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. This is the introduction to one of the other sandwich stories. Uh, very interesting topic, uh, Jairus. The Bible brings out certain things about him. One is that he was a ruler. You know, when you are a ruler, you're used to having things your way. You know, you speak and people jump. You say go, they go forward. You say stop, they stop. You make commands and people obey. And I think it's significant that the Bible used the word rulers in the story because Jairus came to Jesus. But you'll notice that as we break this down forensically, that uh, although he came to Jesus and was a ruler of the synagogue, the Bible talks about the attitude he had pertaining to his request to Jesus. So the question was asked by the uh, Bible, by the Sabbath school lesson uh, orchestrator, so to speak, what characteristics particularly stand out about J Jairus, or Jairus, as some people will say. I brought out four things that were particularly interesting to me, and I'll, I'll go back to the verses and refer to them. One of them was humility, humility. A ruler who could have said to Jesus, command that you come to my house, but he didn't. He came to him, and the Bible said he fell at his feet, which is a posture of humility, a ruler at the critical moment of his life, willing to humble himself before Jesus. Well, about humility, remember this phrase, until you are willing to bow on your knees, you are not fit to stand on your feet. Until you are willing to bow on your knees, you are not fit or qualified to stand on your feet. A ruler willing to bow on his knees before Jesus, knowing that in him, he obviously, as a ruler of the synagogue, heard about Jesus. He heard him teach in the synagogues. He understood as far as the other rulers were concerned. But I believe at this particular moment, while the other rulers may have rejected the divinity of Jesus, I believe that Jairus came to him because he recognized that if anyone could bring relief to his daughter, it could be Jesus. So the first thing I saw was humility. What does the Bible say about humility? First Peter 5 and verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time or in due season. So the Bible also says humility comes before honor. You see, if you want your life to be a life where honor exists, you have to be an individual that's willing to be humbled, humbled in the sight of the Lord and also sometimes humbled in the sight of others. You know, my wife and I, uh, we pray for humility, and um, there was one particular camp meeting. We've seen a lot of instances, but this particular one stands out in our minds. We were invited to speak at a, a camp meeting in Tennessee, a Tennessee conference, and um, months earlier, they called and said, we want your bio, we want a picture, 
uh, we were putting together our color brochure. They said, this is a huge camp meeting. We have beautiful full color brochures. And we arrived in um, Memphis, Tennessee uh, for the uh, camp meeting. And they gave us the brochure and I opened this beautifully colored brochure. My picture wasn't anywhere to be found. <laughs> I was the keynote speaker for the whole <laughs> camp meeting. And when they gave me the brochure and I looked inside and I looked up and the lady to whom I sent the picture, she said, oh my goodness, you sent me that picture more than a month ago, I just forgot to have it in the program. I just forgot to put it. I said, well, will that prevent me from still speaking? She said, no, 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 not at all. So all my sermon titles were there on the days that I was speaking. So Angie and I went back to the room and we just busted out laughing. We said, Lord, we prayed for humility, but that was over the top. <laughs> I mean, that was a little too much. And we kept that program. He said, I'm the keynote speaker at the camp meeting. Everybody's pictures, all the seminar presenters, right. and my picture's nowhere to be found. And so sometimes the Lord, let you remind, reminds us that, yeah, I'm still working on humility. And, uh, but the beautiful thing about that is when you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you or lift you up in due time. So be weary if you are lifting yourself up. If you are exalting yourself, you give Jesus no room to do that. But no one can exalt you in the time he sees fit and the time that is right in your character than Jesus can. The second thing I saw in uh, Jairus the ruler was urgency. And the second thing, the Bible says he begged him earnestly. Urgency. He could have commanded him, but he decided to beg him instead. Something about the life of Jesus brought humility and urgency to the heart of Jairus, which is the second thing about urgency. Until we are aware of our deepest need, we will not experience our deepest peace. Mm -hmm. Until we are aware of our deepest need, we will not know our deepest peace. Jairus was able to survive the interruption that came, the sandwich that came to him. And what does the Bible say about urgency? Hebrews 3.15, today, if you will hear my voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. Urgency, he knew that that was a pivotal moment in his life. He needed the Lord, but the sandwich part, I'll come back to this, was on the way to remedy Jairus' situation, Jesus meets the woman who was bleeding for 12 long years. He remedies her situation and in the middle of remedying her situation, someone came that was a part of Jairus's entourage and says, don't trouble the master any longer. She's passed. And the Lord encouraged Jairus at that moment saying, this is not, this is not going to work out the way that you see it. And he said in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 5 and verse 34, uh, actually verse 34 is when he went to the home and began to speak to Jairus' daughter. But um, he brought to that home the, the strength and the encouragement that was needed, and he brought his daughter back to life. Mm -hmm. So the moments of desperation are not moments of desperation for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And Jairus learned that the woman was freed, her faith had made her well, and he continued in his journey which brings me to the third point, desperation. Until we are really willing to reach beyond ourselves, we will never get beyond ourselves. We have to reach beyond ourselves to get beyond ourselves. The Lord was told by Jairus, come and lay your hand on her that she may be healed and she will live. What does the Bible say about desperation? Psalm 119 verse 60, I make haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. So if we are hasty about being obedient to the Lord, there's no need in our lives that the Lord will ignore. He did not ignore Jairus' need. He did, he did not ignore the need of his daughter, but he understood the desperation in Jairus' heart was not because he was a commander, but he was one who was willing to be humbled in the presence of the Lord. And the fourth thing was not about Jairus, but about Jesus, which is in verse, in the story of Mark chapter five, verses, 21 down to 24. And the Bible says in verse 24, Jesus went with him. You know, when you come to Jesus with the right attitude and the right circumstance, although the situations may seem wrong, Jesus responds. And here's the point. Until we come to Jesus, we cannot follow after him. Mm -hmm. Jairus came to Jesus and then was now relegated to follow Jesus to his home mm -hmm. to receive the miracle of the raising of his daughter. Philippians 1 verse 10, 
that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The Lord responded in sincerity to Jairus because Jairus responded in sincerity to the Lord. A roller coaster with Jesus, that's the best place to be. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. That was rich. I have lesson, uh, Wednesday's lesson, Rejection and Reception. And it's based on Mark 6, verses 1 through 6, and the parallel uh, verses in Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 through 58, and Luke 4, verses 16 through 30. And as Pastor just said, in Mark 5, Jesus raised Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead. When he told the mourners that she was sleeping, they ridiculed him. So he put them out. He went into the room with the parents and the three uh, disciples that he took with him. And he resurrected the girl. And those who were with him, it says, were overcome with great amazement. Now let's compare that with what happened to Jesus when he went to his hometown of Nazareth. When he went back home to Nazareth, he went from those who were overcome with great amazement to the astonishment of his hometownsmen who heard him read in the synagogue. So Jesus got up to read in the synagogue on Sabbath, and when he read, the people around him it says they were astonished. And when I saw the word astonished, I thought at first it meant impressed. No, no, no. They were offended. Mm -hmm. They were offended by what he said. They were thinking, who does he think he is? He's one of us. Don't we know? Is, wait, isn't he the son of Joseph, the carpenter? Don't we know his siblings? We know where he came from. And they couldn't wrap their minds around this man who had been raised around them, who hadn't been educated in the best schools with the elite. He was one of them, and yet he was ascending beyond them. And so the first point that I'd like to share is their perception of him, their rejection of him. When he came home to his country, his town of Nazareth, he was rejected. Jesus lived a life of rejection. In Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. So the first point that jumped out at me in Mark 6 was the perception, the rejection of Christ by his countrymen. Rejection is a potent issue. It can change the quality of someone's life. The definition of rejection is, quote, the act of refusing to accept, use, or believe something or someone, end quote. And interpersonal rejection just ranks as one of the most profound, impactful issues in a person's life. It can compromise the quality of a person's life. I think about a friend of mine named Anne. And Anne had something happen to her when she was three years old that she never, never could shake. She was raised in a home when she was three. Her mom had conceived her, we'll call her mom Lynn, had conceived Anne when she was around 13. And then she had a baby brother for Anne when she was 17. And Lynn was wayward and disrespectful and unruly. And so her mother decided that I can't deal with Lynn anymore. I'm going to send her to a home for wayward minors. So Lynn and little Anne were outside in the yard and a policeman came to pick up Lynn. And Anne was a few feet away from her mom when the policeman said, I'm here to take Lynn to this home. And Lynn screamed, I can't leave my baby. And little Anne ran to her mom with her arms open wide and her mom brushed past her and went into the house to say goodbye to the baby brother. 
and did not talk to baby Anne. And Anne never got over that. She was mm -hmm. devastated mm -hmm. by that rejection. Well, Anne did not see her mother for 16 years after that. She was bumped around from foster home to foster home. And she had this tough exterior. What happened with Anne was that a friend of hers introduced her to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And she finally, she had never felt loved before. She'd never felt cared for before. Finally, she was cared for and cared about. She knew that Jesus loved her. You see, Jesus had suffered rejection himself. And so he says before, before, um, he, he said to her, to us, in John 6, 37, he said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will in no means, by no means, cast out. Jesus is saying to us that whoever comes to him he will not be rejected by him. He was rejected. He knows what it feels like, and he will never reject us. And then the second point that jumped out at me with this passage of scripture was the relationship between faith and miracles. And we're told in Mark 5 that Jesus had healed the woman with the, an issue of blood. And this healing took place when Jesus wasn't even paying it. He wasn't focused on the woman. The crowd was just thronging him and he was walking through the crowd. So he was being touched by a lot of people. But when he had this special touch, this touch of faith, he stopped. And he said, who touched me? And the disciples were like, who touched you? There's a crowd here. But he knew that this was a different touch. It was the touch of faith. And so in verse 34, Mark 5, he said to the woman with the issue of blood, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. It is faith in God, not just some you know, hocus pocus kind of faith that some people try to promote. No, it's faith, particularly in God, in Jesus Christ, that activates the miracles of God. And that's why in verse five of Mark six, it states that Jesus could do no mighty work in Nazareth because he marveled, it says, because of their unbelief. Unbelief shuts the door mm -hmm. to the miracles from God. Unbelief is what blocks our blessings. Point number four, Jesus walked in his divine destiny and so can we. In Luke four, again, one of the parallel passages for Mark six, Luke four verses 16 to 30, we see an expanded version of Mark six, one through six. And here Jesus goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he reads from Isaiah 61, verses one through three. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me mm -hmm. because the Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And he continues to explain what his personal uh, ministry really was going to be. It was a declaration of Christ's divine destiny, a personal manifesto, if you will, of God's plan for his life of service. And we each have a divine destiny, God's plan for our lives that is written in a book. Psalm 139 verses 14 through 16 says, I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And here, here's what I love. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book, they all are, were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Even before we were formed in the womb, mm -hmm. God had a plan mm -hmm. for all of us. We are not here by chance. There is a divine destiny that we have. And then the final point is, Jesus sent them out in pairs. He sent the disciples out in pairs. He knew that the mission would be very hard and difficult and lonely for them. They needed to be able to share, to be able to, at the end of a hard day, share what had happened and it would reinforce their faith. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, 
two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered by another. Two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I want to tell you that Jesus is the third cord, that he is who binds us together Amen. and helps us to accomplish his mission. Amen. Amen. Thank Thank great you. study. Thank Praise you to Lord. each and every one of you. My name is Shelley Quinn. I have Thursday's lesson, A Different Kind of Messiah. Now, it seems like we're kind of jumping ahead a little here. Let me give you a little background for this. Jesus is uh, we, we find in Matthew 32 that he's feeding the, the people here, the 5,000. And, and what happened was Jesus and his disciples, they're tired. He'd sent, gone by boat over to a remote area on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And this crowd sees where he's going and they run along the seashore and they're running and they actually, the crowd is there to meet him. So it says in Mark 6, 34, and Jesus, when he came out of the boat, he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. You know that in his humanity, Jesus was tired. He had said they hadn't even had time to eat as they were ministering. And he would told his people, let's get aside for a while. So he's tired. He's hungry himself, but he was moved with compassion because these people were helpless, hungry, like sheep. And when I say hungry, they are spiritually hungry. They were exposed to peril. So they needed his guidance and his protection. And he knew that their spiritual condition was worse than their physical condition. Mm. So he began teaching and he taught all day long. It says in verse 35, when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away. What are they saying? We're tired. We've been ministering all day. It's deserted. Let's, let's send them away so we can go rest. I think that's what they're saying. And it said, send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. So the disciples are looking through the lens of human reasoning right? Mm -hmm. They're tired. They're physically exhausted themselves. They're hungry. And they're looking at this great group of people. In the Greek, it says there's 5,000 men. The word men is not a generic term. It meant adult males. So there were many more when you added the children and the women and children into there. So his, his disciples are saying, dismiss them. Let's, let's get some rest, like you said. But Jesus answered them in verse 37. He said to them, you give them something to eat. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever prayed? I've, I've prayed before and I'm asking the Lord to help someone or do this or do that. And I've heard the same thing. You take mm -hmm. action. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, Lord. <laughs> I thought it was a great idea, but you mean you put that idea in my heart? So he says, they said to him, well, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? He was commanding the impossible. 200 denarii for eight months would be equivalent to eight months wages. It was beyond their capability, but their reasoning with human reason. So he says to them in verse 38, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Now, the loaves, when I think of a loaf of bread, I'm thinking of a good chunk of bread. No, these were little rolls. They were small little bread cakes, five little bread cakes and two fish. So verse 39 says, 
Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. And most likely they either sat them down in groups that were in a semicircle or like uh, uh, three sides of a square so they could have access and, and distribute the food easily. So it says, here's what I love. Verse 41, and this is Mark 6, 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, this is Jesus. He's got the five loaves and the two fish in his hands. He looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. Between the act of prayer of Jesus Christ the breaking and the distributing, the miracle took place in Jesus' hands. I love it. This is a pattern for ministry. Jesus provides the resources to us and then he tells us, go, go into all the world, make disciples. And you know, here they are, they're seated on the green grass, right? They're fully satisfied. You know what's just been pictured? The true shepherd of Psalm 23, who makes his sheep lie down in green pastures. He had arrived, right? So verse 44 says, these who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. And as I said, Matthew 14 adds, plus women and children. That men meant adult males only. Verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. Now, this is interesting. Jesus now dismisses them to go by boat. He stays behind. He sends the multitudes home. They're full. They're happy. They've been spiritually fed. They've been physically fed. He departs to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, verse 47, says the boat was in the middle of the sea now, and he was alone on the land. And then verse 48 says, he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. So they're out in the middle of the lake. And it says now about the fourth watch of the night, that would be between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. He came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out for they all saw him and were troubled. Get this in your mind. They're exhausted. They are straining against the wind in the middle of this crazy storm. And suddenly Jesus supernatural power is on full display here. But when they see him coming, they're so exhausted, all they can think of is they're fearful and it's, it's some kind of a phantom. But here's the takeaway. Jesus never abandons his disciples in a storm. Mm -hmm. So immediately he said, that he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I. You know what, literally this is I am. This is the Yahweh of the burning bush in Exodus 3. Yes. This is the one who says to them, do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. So he's reassuring them. Verse 51, then he went up the boat to them and this wind ceased and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure. I love that when the Bible uses beyond measure. Mm -hmm. They were astonished and they marveled for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Their heart wasn't hardened to Jesus. They loved Jesus. Mm -hmm. Their heart was hardened to truth. And you know why? They had pre conceived opinions. The rulers of the synagogues, the tradition had become to preach 
the coming of the Messiah as though he were going to be a political mm. deliverer, a military man. Mm. And maybe they looked at Jesus when it says he didn't understand about the loaves and they thought, well, he's like another Moses calling down the manna. But they didn't yet recognize him as Yahweh. So here's the point. How critical is it for us to understand the prophecy about his second coming? Mm -hmm. If most of the rulers, most many of the Jews missed his first coming because they had preconceived ideas where they had twisted the scriptures, it was the traditions of men, how careful must we be that we're not looking for a different kind of return? Amen. Thank you each for your comments, study, your, your thoughts here. As I've been listening, I've felt kind of surrounded by the lake and the miracles going on at the lake. So let's take a, a few final moments for comments at the end. Yes, I'm reading from Desire of Ages, page 258. Every man is free to choose from what power he will have to rule over him. None have fallen so low, none are so vile that they can find deliverance in Christ. The demoniac, in place of prayer, could utter only the words of Satan, yet the heart's unspoken appeal was heard. No cry from a, from a soul in need, though it fail of, of utterance in words, will be unheeded. Jesus will hear your cry. Try it. And when you look at that sandwich topic of Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood and the healing of one and the raising of the other one's daughter. You think about timing. What is divine timing compared to human urgency? Remember this, nothing happens before it's time. Even the coming of the Lord to everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heavens. Don't be in a hurry. God is always on time. Amen. Jesus was rejected by those who knew him best. And when faced with rejection and hurt, we should remind ourselves that Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. The people of Jesus day expected the Messiah to come and be a deliverer, a ruler, but he didn't come to rule. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. Have you accepted his free gift of salvation that he paid for? with his own precious blood. I love something that Shelley said there on Thursday's lesson. The miracle took place in Jesus' hands. Isn't that where you want to be? Whether you're on the upside of the roller coaster or the downside, whether in a storm, whether hungry, whatever it is, we want to be in Jesus' hands because he says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. It's not the world's peace. It's mine. And that's what we want. So come back and join us again next week. Lesson six, an intriguing title, Inside Out. But we'll figure it out next week as we study Mark 7 together. See you next week.